Welcome to Volume 4 of the Princeton Review WordSmart Vocabulary Building Program. By the end of this hour-long recording, you will be well acquainted with more than 50 words, words that you will encounter frequently when reading, and words that will expand your vocabulary so that you will be a more powerful and effective speaker. Here's how our system works. Each group of words is broken into complementary halves. For example, the first is called alone or together. That group has two parts to it, so we'll examine each half individually, first alone, then together. Then, when both halves have been covered, we'll review the group as a whole and mix things up a bit. Here's our first group, alone or together. I'd like to start with the words that have to do with being alone. The notion of being alone frequently conjures negative images of people, being without others, lacking companionship, feeling lonely. But ironically, the word alone is derived from a contraction of the words all one, the prefix all meaning closer. So when you are alone, you are able to get closer to yourself. And that's a positive connotation. Right. Being alone can help you learn to be independent, make your own decisions, and feel autonomous. Autonomous means acting independently. For example, the West Coast office of the law firm was quite autonomous. It never asked the East Coast office permission before it did anything. An autonomous nation is one that is independent. It governs itself. It is said to have autonomy. I act autonomously, and that means I act on my own authority. I do, too. And because I am autonomous, I am going to move on to the second word, celibacy. I'm not familiar with that word. Well, a person who abstains from sex is said to practice celibacy. Oh. So a monk probably practices celibacy. Right you are. A monk is bound by vows to a religious life, and that usually means he is celibate. I guess that makes sense because a monk's life is fairly solitary. But being celibate demands that one practice self-denial. As a monk, one must give up the things of the world and devote oneself to religious exercises, which is an ascetic life. Ascetic means monk-like or practicing self-denial. For instance, in my second year of graduate school, I led an ascetic existence. I was trying to save money, so I never went out. I ate a lot of soup for dinner. But you probably got a good deal of work done. Yes. You know, many people confuse ascetic with the word aesthetic, which means artistic or having to do with beauty. And they certainly mean different things. An ascetic lifestyle is not aesthetically fulfilling. Unless you think that bare walls and empty cupboards are beautiful. My friends thought I was a hermit that year. They all accused me of being reclusive. Reclusive means withdrawn from society or hermit-like. Howard Hughes, the millionaire, led a reclusive existence. He shut himself up in his mansion and didn't care for the outside world. He is a good example of someone considered to be a recluse. You just use the word as a noun. When I add the suffix I-V-E, which means having to do with, to recluse, it becomes an adjective. Right. Reclusive describes a person who wants to be alone, a recluse. So a recluse is someone who sequesters himself. Sequester means to set or keep apart. Like when juries are sequestered, they're shut up in hotel rooms by themselves for the course of a trial so they won't be in contact with anyone. So you can also say the struggling writer sequestered himself in his study for several months trying to produce the great American novel. The next word is polarize. It means to break up into opposing factions or groupings. I always remember what polarize means because of the root word pole. You can't get farther apart than the North and South Poles. So a heated argument can polarize a group of people. It can divide them, making them far apart from each other. For example, the increasingly acrimonious debate between the two candidates polarized the political party. Which brings us to another word, chasm, meaning a deep, gaping hole or a gorge. Chasm is a terrific word because it can be taken literally or figuratively. For example, the villains were approaching rapidly, so the heroine grabbed the boy and swung across the chasm on a slender vine. Or, figuratively speaking, Bill was so stupid that his girlfriend wondered whether there wasn't a chasm where his brain should be. I hope that Bill wasn't complacent about his girlfriend's opinion. Complacent means self-satisfied, overly contented with oneself. To fall into a complacent attitude is to become uncaring about the world around you. That's correct. The football team won so many games that it became complacent, and the worst team in the league snuck up and beat it. Good example. If the world becomes complacent about the state of the environment, we could end up with wide-scale destruction of the rainforests. In that case, we should try and sequester part of the rainforest in order to protect it. Sequester means to set or keep apart. 
Now let's review the words that deal with being alone. Autonomous. Acting independently. Celibacy. Abstinence from sexual intercourse. Ascetic. Hermit-like or practicing self-denial. Reclusive. Withdrawn from society. Polarized. Break into opposing factions. Chasm. A deep gaping hole. Complacent. Self-satisfied. Sequester. Set or keep apart. Now we're going to present a speech by someone who will use all of these words. Ready? Here we go. I made a fortune when I discovered an oil well in my backyard. For a while I lived a high life, dating movie starlets, indulging all the luxuries money can buy. Rather pleased with myself, I became too complacent. Money gave me independence and control over my life. But being autonomous financially could not protect me from a broken heart. Ever since Daisy DuPont left me, I have withdrawn from society and sequestered myself in my old country cabin. I've stripped down my existence to simple, spiritual pursuits devoid of ordinary comforts, and this ascetic lifestyle suits my current mood. There are no women here to remind me of Daisy or tempt me with intimate pleasures. I live like a monk who's taken a vow of celibacy. My very best friend, Joe Bob, doesn't understand why I've left town to live alone and be a recluse. There's a great gap between us now, and this chasm is hard to bridge. Joe Bob and I don't agree on the best way to mend a broken heart, and these differences have polarized our relationship. I'm totally alone now. We'll now move on to words that have to do with being together. I'm happy to cooperate with you on that. You are a terrific partner, and the fact that we complement each other helps us work well together. Thank you. I think we do, too. And I'm delighted that you introduced our first word, compliment, in your compliment. Uh-oh, now you're really being tricky, using the word compliment in two different ways. When I said we complement each other well, I used the word compliment as meaning to complete, to be the perfect counterpart, and spelled like complete, C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. We work together well and can complete... Each other's sentences? That's right, like yin is to yang. Or peanut butter to jelly. Now, when I thanked you for your compliment, I used a homophone. Compliment, meaning praise, sounds the same, but doesn't mean the same thing. And the middle syllable is spelled P-L-I. It's easy to remember that to compliment, or praise, is spelled with an I. Just think, I like getting compliments. And compliment, as in perfect counterpart, is spelled P-L-E, as in complete. The flower arrangement was a perfect complement to the table decorations. The English language is pretty tricky. Honestly, you have to wonder whether a group of comedians secretly got together and, in collusion, created the English language just to keep us all amused and puzzled. There you go again, sneaking in a new word. Collusion means a conspiracy or a secret cooperation. For example, when there's a rise in oil prices, it's probably the result of collusion between the oil-producing countries. Right. Collusion usually has a negative meaning. When a group works together secretly, they can exercise power, sometimes unfairly. There seems to be a collusion among all the cigarette manufacturers to downplay the hazardous side effects of smoking. I agree with you, but would add that the public has a complicity in that wrongdoing. By not quitting ourselves or urging friends and family to give up smoking, we are silent partners in crime. That is why complicity means participation in wrongdoing or the act of being an accomplice. For instance, there was complicity between the bank robber and the dishonest teller. The teller neglected to turn on the alarm, and the robber rewarded him with half the loot. They worked together, just as the complicity among the students made it impossible to determine which of them had stolen the math test. Do you realize that so far all of our words begin with the prefix co? Good point. Co means coming together or jointly, which is what this word group is about. Another together word that starts with co is coalesce which means to come together as one, to fuse and unite. For example, the people in our neighborhood coalesced into a powerful force for change in the community. A coalition is a group of people that have come together for some purpose, often a political one. Coal miners and coal miners might coalesce into a coalition for the purpose of persuading coal mine owners to provide coal machines in coal mines. The coal miners and coal miners had to sign a pledge or a covenant to act as a single whole. A covenant is a solemn oath, contract, or pledge. A covenant can't exist alone because it's an agreement. It has to be made with others. It frequently has religious connotations. The promises of God.
head in to absorb time thoroughly. The fact is similar to that definition to take me to assimilate my idea is to take me as thoroughly as if you had eaten it. Your body assimilates nutrients from the food you eat. It absorbs the nutrients. You know, people can be assimilated too. I didn't have any friends when I changed schools in eighth grade, but I gradually assimilated. I became part of the new community. When you were elected class president last year, your assimilation was complete. You must have had a great deal of charisma in order to win so much loyalty from your classmates. The students were sharing my personality, and that's what charisma means, right? Yes. Charisma means a magnetic ability to attract followers or inspire loyalty. So one could say that the glamorous presidential candidate had a lot of charisma. Voters didn't seem to support him so much as be entranced by him. Right. The evangelist's undeniable charisma enabled him to bring in millions of dollars in donations to his television show. Well, I don't know whether I would have been called charismatic, meaning to have charisma, or whether the student body was charmed by me because I promised them a three-day weekend if they voted for me. So you established a reciprocal arrangement with your class. They vote for you, you give them a three-day weekend. Exactly. Reciprocal means mutual, shared, interchangeable. The Rochester Club had a reciprocal arrangement with the Duluth Club. Members at either club had full privileges of membership at the other. So if the Capulet family and the Montague family hate each other, we can say that their hatred was reciprocal. If you reciprocate, you are repaying or returning in kind. Peter hit Paul over the head with a stick. Paul reciprocated by punching Peter in the nose. My neighbor had me over for dinner three times, but I've been unable to reciprocate immediately because my dining room is being remodeled. Now that I know you failed to reciprocate with your new neighbors, I don't feel so bad about that three-day weekend. You mean the students voted for you and you didn't repay them? Well, a three-day weekend was more than even I could pull off with my incredible charisma. But the students and I established a reciprocity, meaning reciprocal arrangement, when I won them a school trip to the amusement park. In a reciprocity, both parties gain. The students felt pleased that you got them a trip. And I got elected. Let's review these words and then move on to another speech which will use these words in context. Compliment. To complete. To be the perfect counterpart. Collusion. A conspiracy or secret cooperation. Complicity. Participation in wrongdoing, the act of being an accomplice. Covenant. A solemn agreement. Coalesce. To come together as one, to fuse or unite. Consonant. Harmonious in agreement. Assimilate. To take in or learn thoroughly. Charisma. A magical ability to inspire loyalty. Reciprocal. Mutual, shared, interchangeable. Terrific. Now it's time for our speaker. I never thought I'd ever join a sorority. Sororities seemed like secret conspiracies, women who were in collusion to exclude others. But when I got to college, I was overwhelmed. I felt so out of place, I didn't think I would ever assimilate. So I joined Alpha Beta Pi. I have to admit, I didn't think I had enough charm or charisma for the sorority to choose me. But the sisters told me that a good listener was just what they needed among so many bubbly personalities. I was a welcome addition, a perfect complement to their group of gregarious women. I made a lot of good friends in the sorority, and we helped each other out. My friend Eleanor would bake cookies for me in exchange for tutoring her in calculus. This reciprocal arrangement suited both of us just fine, though I did put on a few pounds. I loved watching her mix together all the different ingredients, the flour, sugar, butter, eggs, and chocolate chips, which would coalesce into a big blob of cookie dough. When we first joined the sorority, all members had to sign a solemn oath, a covenant swearing eternal loyalty. We also had to agree not to smoke marijuana in the sorority house. This was in accord with my own beliefs, and I was happy to see we were consonant on the issue of drug use. I think I want to run for political office after I graduate, so I don't even want to be near pot smokers, let alone inhale, for fear that I might be accused of complicity in an illegal act. We're now going to review all the alone and together words, but this time we'll mix them up. 
First, we'll simply name a word and give you time to think of the definition. After the pause, a concise definition will follow, along with another example. Complacent. Complacent means self satisfied. After Jack inherited his aunt's fortune, he became complacent and stopped trying to get a new job. Coalesce. To coalesce is to come together as one, to fuse or unite. Their ideas coalesced into a focused plan of action. Charisma. Charisma is the magnetic ability to inspire loyalty. The singer actress Madonna has a lot of charisma. Chasm. Chasm, a deep gaping hole. There's such a chasm between what you say and what you do that you run the risk of being called a hypocrite. Celibacy. Celibacy, abstinence from sexual intercourse. After Jane broke up with her boyfriend, she endured a long month of celibacy. Assimilate. To assimilate is to take in or learn thoroughly. The immigrants learned English quickly, so they found it easy to assimilate American customs. Recluse. Someone who is withdrawn from society is a recluse. Sequester. To sequester is to set or keep apart. The sequestered jury was not allowed to talk to anyone or hear news reports about the trial. Collusion. Collusion is conspiracy or secret cooperation. The Russian and American agents turned out to be in collusion, sharing their government secrets. Compliment. A compliment is the perfect counterpart. To compliment something is to complete it, to provide something lacking or needed. Max, an accountant, was a perfect compliment to Mary, a novelist. Polarize. To polarize is to break into opposing factions. The Republican Party was polarized by differing views on social values. Autonomous. To be autonomous is to be independent, self-governing. The two-year-old thought he was autonomous and walked away from his mother. Complicity. Complicity means participation in wrongdoing, the act of being an accomplice. The crook's little brother was suspected of complicity in the robbery. Ascetic. Ascetic, hermit-like or practicing self-denial. Nuns live an ascetic life. Consonant. Consonant, harmonious in agreement. The decision to build a new gym was consonant with the headmaster's belief in physical education. Reciprocal. Reciprocal means mutual, shared, interchangeable. Canada and the U.S. have reciprocal trade agreements. Covenant. A covenant is a solemn agreement. Lewis made a covenant with his parents never to drink and drive. Now that we've finished alone or together, go over the spelling of all the words on the enclosed insert card and look for clues in the words that will help you remember their meanings. I look at consensus and see the word consent, which helps me remember that consensus is agreement. Right. When I look at ascetic, it reminds me of antiseptic. It has a hard, dry sound and look. It doesn't feel like a comfortable word, and reminds me that it means a lifestyle which involves rigid self-denial. I'll have to use that mnemonic device when I try and keep ascetic separate from aesthetic. Aesthetic has the soft the sound in it, and it has to do with beauty. In any case, you have to create your own mnemonic devices for words that you have trouble remembering. As silly as they may sound, if they work, they work. Our next selection is titled "Now You See It, Now You Don't." These words all deal with perception. "Now You See It" includes words that describe what is obvious or easily perceptible. "Now You Don't" is a group of words that all deal with what is unclear or tricky. I'd like to start with the more mysterious words, the "Now You Don't" words. I bet you can't guess why. Oh, I see. You're giving me an ideal introduction for the first word. You're being 
cryptic when you ask me a mysterious question like that. Cryptic means mystifying or mysterious. A cryptic statement is one in which something important remains hidden. When the three witches appeared to Macbeth, they made cryptic comments concerning his future. He had to puzzle over the meanings of these comments. Cryptic is often associated with things that are supernatural or at least puzzling. When I had my palm read, I understood everything I was told until the palm reader began making cryptic remarks about walls tumbling and curved arrows. When someone is being cryptic, they are going to cause the listener to be bemused, which means confused or bewildered. Bemused is a terrific word. It makes you think of amused, but really it's the opposite. To muse is to think. The prefix a means not. So someone who's amused is too busy giggling to think. And the prefix b means having to do with. So bemused is having to do with thinking or preoccupied in thought. Just like belated means having to do with being late. Ralph was bemused when all the lights and appliances in his house began switching on and off for no apparent reason. I stood bemused in the middle of the parking lot at Disneyland. I was trying, desperately trying, to remember where I had parked my car. I would conjecture that a security guard had to help you find it. Actually, you're wrong. But because you only conjectured, meaning you made a guess based on little evidence, your mistake is not surprising. I found the car myself, but after two hours of searching. Children often ask their parents to conjecture. I was always asking "what if" questions to my mother. I wasn't satisfied until I got an answer, so she'd always conjecture, even though she didn't really know. Like. How many people have you met in your whole entire life? Exactly. If I had to conjecture, I would say I've met about a thousand people in my life. Wow. How do you have time for anything else? You know, conjecture can also be a noun. The defense lawyer argued that the accused man's reputation for being promiscuous was mere conjecture on the part of the prosecutor. No one had any proof that he was promiscuous. The next word, ambiguous, means unclear in meaning or capable of being interpreted in different ways. That sounds like cryptic. Ambiguous is a little more general, and it means uncertain, not mystifying. So one might say, we listened to the weather report, but the forecast was ambiguous. We couldn't tell if the day was going to be rainy or sunny. Right. Or also, the poem Julie read in English class was ambiguous. The students couldn't tell if it was about someone being born or someone dying. Another thing to note is that feelings can be ambiguous. I might have ambiguous feelings about a guy I'm not sure I like. It's certainly not clear to him how I feel. Another word that is similar in meaning is dubious. It means full of doubt, uncertain. When a person is dubious, he or she is skeptical. It's as if they're saying, "I doubt it." So if I said I could stick my fist through a keyhole, you would be dubious. Yes, and I wouldn't want you to try. Here's another example. Anne was dubious about Christopher's ability to learn flamenco dancing. Her dubiety was justified. He couldn't even learn to waltz. Dubious and doubtful don't mean exactly the same thing. A dubious person is a person who has doubts. A doubtful outcome is an outcome that isn't certain to occur. Sam's chances of getting the job were doubtful because the employer was dubious of his claim that he had been president of the United States while in high school. The next word is abstruse, which means hard to understand. Nuclear physics is a subject that is too abstruse for most people. The professor's article on mathematical philosophy was very abstruse. Michael couldn't even pronounce the words in it. The way I remember the meaning of abstruse is by linking it to the word abstract. Abstract means theoretical, not concrete. Abstract art uses designs and forms that have little relationship to observable reality. In an abstract painting, a face may very well look like four lines and a question mark. To like something in the abstract is to like the idea of it. I've always liked mountain climbing in the abstract, but when I actually tried it, I got vertigo. That's too bad. Jane's history paper was abstract. It didn't even deal with a particular event. It dealt with the concept of history as conflict. Good. So things that are abstract are sometimes hard to understand because they deal with ideas. Which brings us back to why I link abstruse and abstract. Abstract concepts are often abstruse. They are theoretical and thus tricky to comprehend. Well, your mnemonic device helped us to learn another word. Our last word, recondite, is another word that means hard to understand. It is often used to describe academic language. For example, 
The philosopher's thesis was so recondite that even his protege had difficulty getting past the first two sentences. Or, every now and then, the professor would lift her head from her desk and deliver some recondite pronouncement that left us scratching our heads, stumped. Abstruse and recondite are practically synonyms, but there are very subtle differences. Recondite tends to refer to difficult or scholarly language. Abstruse is a bit more general and frequently refers to tough concepts. But any way you slice it, they mean hard to understand. Well, now you've heard all the now you don't words, words that have to do with things that aren't clear. You'll hear all of them used in context right after we quickly review their meanings. Cryptic, mystifying or mysterious, bemused, confused or bewildered, conjecture, a guess made with little evidence, ambiguous, unclear or capable of being interpreted in different ways, dubious. Full of doubt, abstruse, difficult to understand, abstract, theoretical, not concrete, recondite, hard to understand. Good. Let's move on to the speech. I work the night beat in what appears to be a peaceful suburb. Fortunately, we've had some strange things happening this year. I made a routine call last week. Some lady says there's screaming in the parking lot near her apartment. I get there and I'm mystified. Written in blood is this cryptic message. It says, "Cops read blood." Without much to go on, I make a kind of an educated guess, a conjecture really, that this is written by some kooky kid, probably with chicken blood. But then I consider the matter a little more, and doubt starts to creep in. I get really dubious about my initial guess. Why would a kid do it, and what were the screams? At this point, I'm totally bewildered, thoroughly bemused. There's no crime yet, so I figure I'll wait and see what comes out in the wash. I was too shaken up to think about this event in concrete terms, so I stuck to the abstract. Then I get a call. This guy starts explaining to me about weird devil worshiping stuff. He's trying to explain about all these ancient Latin incantations, and it all went right over my head. I found it all too abstruse. I was completely confused. Then I get a letter. It says, "I want to be absolutely clear, so let me wipe out any ambiguity." That's all it said. So now I'm really worried. So I get myself an article on devil worshiping, but it's written by some professor, and it's so recondite that I can't get through it. I'm going to have to call in some devil experts to help me figure this out. We've covered the words that have to do with things that aren't clear. The now you don't words. Now it's time to take a gander at the now you see it words. These words all relate to that which is obvious or clear. Let's jump right in. Blatant means unpleasantly loud, obvious, or glaring. David was blatantly critical of our efforts. That is, he was obnoxiously obvious in making his criticisms. The loudmouth student showed blatant disrespect for authority. You could also say that the woman with ten food processors hidden under her coat told a blatant lie when she said she didn't have any stolen merchandise from the kitchen store. Right. Now, blatant usually indicates something loud, but your example doesn't imply that the woman screamed her lie. Instead, it means that her lie was very obvious. Another word, flagrant, is often confused with blatant. Flagrant means glaringly bad, notorious, or scandalous. So a flagrant theft is stealing a car from the lot behind the police station. And a flagrant spelling error is one that jumps right off the page because it's so noticeable. So flagrant usually has to do with something you see, whereas blatant usually refers to speech. So to return to the lady with the food processors, she told a blatant lie, which was easily perceived because she flagrantly shoplifted so much merchandise. Your understanding of the distinction between the two words is perfectly manifest. Manifest means visible or evident. Darrell's anger at the hospital staff was manifest. You could see it in his expression and hear it in his voice. There is manifest danger in riding a unicycle along the edge of a cliff. Manifest can also be a verb, meaning to make visible. Chip was sick for a long time, but only yesterday did he manifest symptoms. And a manifestation is a visible showing. The first manifestation of winter was the frost on my window this morning. Salient is the next word, and it means sticking or jutting out. 
conspicuous or striking. Cyrano de Bergerac's salient feature was his nose. It jutted out far beyond his chin. A salient characteristic, like someone's tremendous confidence, leaps right out at you. Discern means to have insight, to see things clearly, or to differentiate. To discern something is to see it clearly. So a writer who demonstrates discernment is a keen observer. I took a wine class so that I would discern the difference in the wide variety of red wines. It's important for political leaders to discern the important issues facing the country and bring them into focus. That's a lucid comment. Lucid means clear and easy to understand. I'm afraid political leaders often avoid being lucid. They think they can avoid dealing with issues or responding by hedging and being vague. A good teacher should be lucid. For example, Professor Hopper gave such a lucid explanation of Einstein's theories that Jill suddenly understood. The next word, candor, means truthfulness or sincere honesty. Teddy appreciated Jimbo's candor. He was glad to know Jimbo thought his sideburns were funny looking. The employee demonstrated candor when he told his boss that the working conditions in the meat packaging plant were unsanitary. When you show candor, you're being candid or honest. To be candid is to speak frankly. Some people think candid means hidden because of the old TV show Candid Camera. What it really means is that it's an honest camera. Usually, films are created and manipulated, so they're not giving an honest view of the world. A hidden camera allows people to behave naturally in an honest or candid manner, but is it art? A good question. I'll use our next word in my response. Philosophers have spent centuries attempting to delineate or accurately describe what art is. If you purposefully stick your feet in paint and walk on a canvas, it's art. What about if you do it by accident? Politicians have tried delineating what they consider to be art in order to distribute funding. They realize it's a very dangerous and difficult task. When you delineate something, you describe it accurately or draw it in outline. Art is a small word with a big meaning. It's tough to define it. An artist can delineate a model's body and features, and then go back and fill in shading. That's using delineate in the literal sense. Or one could say Sharon's peculiar feelings about her pet gorilla were delineated in the newspaper article. The feelings were described accurately. Our last word, ostentatious, means excessively conspicuous or showoffy. For example, a designer is using expensive materials in an ostentatious manner. If every piece of furniture is upholstered in silk or velvet, and every piece of hardware is made of silver or gold, the donor was ostentatious in making his gift to the hospital. He held a press conference to announce the sum. He then handed a twelve-foot replica of the check to the hospital chief of staff, while photographers snapped pictures. You behaved ostentatiously when you wore your diamond necklace to work. Let's quickly review the words: blatant, unpleasantly loud or obvious, flagrant, glaringly bad, scandalous, manifest, visible or evident, salient, jutting out or conspicuous, discern. To have insight, to see things clearly, to differentiate. Lucid, clear, easy to understand. Candor, honesty, truthfulness. Delineate, accurately describe or draw an outline. Ostentatious, excessively conspicuous or showing off. Those are all our now you see it words. Here follows a speech in which all these words are used in their appropriate context. Every week, we have different guests on the show. We want people who are brutally honest, who will speak with full candor. I begin the show by outlining the issues, delineating the problem for the audience. I'm interested in educating our viewers, but in this business, entertainment is all that counts. We're accused of focusing on shocking topics like prostitution and mass murder. Many of our guests have been caught in the act, committing some kind of flagrant perversion in broad daylight. The stickier the topic, the higher the rating. The show is livelier if one of our studio audience members is a loudmouth. Sometimes a guy in the audience will make a comment to one of the guests, and there's no mistaking—he's blatantly trying to pick a fight. 
Now, if the guest is able to cry, that helps also. If they can show a little emotion or manifest some sign of their internal distress, people will watch. My job is to make the subject matter simple and clear, but sometimes the guests are so weird it's hard to stay lucid. Once in a while I'll do a celebrity, but it has to be someone who's not afraid to be showy or ostentatious. It's always good if the guest has some outstanding personal trademark or salient characteristic, like the guy with three arms, for example. In the course of picking guests for the show, I can always tell who to choose because I can quickly discern who is the most interesting, shocking, or volatile. No wonder I have the highest rated show on TV. At this point, we've covered all the words in Now You See It, Now You Don't. We'll combine the two groups and review. Remember to fill in the definition in the pause that follows each word. Okay, let's go. Abstract. Theoretical, not concrete. An idea that can't be proven is abstract. Salient. Salient means jutting out or conspicuous. Marie's second and third heads were definitely her most salient characteristics. Candor. Candor is honesty, truthfulness. I feel the only person I can speak to with candor is my psychotherapist. Ambiguity. Ambiguity is lack of clarity or something that can be interpreted in different ways. Martin's feelings about violence are ambiguous. He says he hates it, but he loves working in the slaughterhouse. Cryptic. Mystifying or mysterious is the meaning of cryptic. For centuries, the markings on the walls of the pyramids were just cryptic drawings to us. Now, however, we can read them. Discern. To discern is to have insight, to see things clearly, to differentiate. Little Abe can only now discern the difference between a cat and a dog. Too bad he'll never have the chance to pet either one. Abstruse. Something abstruse is difficult to understand. Rocket science for most people is very abstruse. Blatant. Blatant means unpleasantly loud or obvious. Roberto hates blatant displays of affection on the street. It makes him feel sad and uncomfortable at the same time. Recondite. Recondite means hard to understand in a particularly scholarly way. Ancient Greek is recondite. Flagrant. If something is flagrant, it's glaringly bad, scandalous. Nixon's abuses of the power of the White House were flagrant enough to have him impeached. Ostentatious. Ostentatious means excessively conspicuous or showing off. Lifestyles of the rich and famous makes a killing off of showing us how ostentatious the rich can be. Bemused. Bemused is confused or bewildered. People who fall in love for the first time often describe feeling a bit bemused by it all. Dubious. Dubious is full of doubt. When Lucy showed him the two holes in her neck, Jonathan was dubious about what they were and how they got there. Delineate. To delineate is to accurately describe or draw in outline. The director carefully delineated the plan for the stunt before lighting the stuntman on fire. Conjecture. A conjecture is a guess made with little evidence. Whether there is life on other planets is a matter of pure conjecture. Manifest. When something is manifest, it is visible or evident. Kevin's love for football was manifest in his heavily beating heart and fast-paced breathing when he watched the game. Lucid. Lucid means clear, easy to understand. I prefer my teachers to be lucid. Otherwise, I usually don't get it. There. Now we're done with. Now you see it. Now you don't. Don't forget to review all the spelling. Our final group is called 
The more things change, the more they stay the same. We'll be covering words that describe things that change and things that stay the same, or at least some related issues. Let's start with the more things change. Our first word in this subgroup is mercurial. It's easy to remember because it's derived from the name of the Greek god Mercury, who of course moved very quickly. A person with a mercurial personality is one who changes rapidly and unpredictably from one mood to another. Mercurial means emotionally unpredictable or rapidly changing in mood. Mercurial Helen was crying one minute, laughing the next. Anyone who is unpredictable or typically irregular can be described as mercurial. Also, think of mercury in a thermometer, which goes up and down depending on the weather. Helen's mercurial moods were as changeable as the weather. Take the root morph, which means shape, and add the prefix meta, which means about or change, and you get metamorphosis, which means quite literally any magical change in form, or more figuratively, a sudden or striking change. For example, when the magician passed his wand over Eileen's head, she underwent a bizarre metamorphosis. She turned into a hamster. That is bizarre. No less than Damien's metamorphosis from college student to Hollywood superstar. Now that was unreal. And furthermore, to undergo a metamorphosis is to metamorphose. That's the verb form. As in, no matter how hard he tried, the accountant was unable to metamorphose the losses into gains. The same goes for Alexander, who tried in vain to proselytize me to his twisted cult of the sun-worshipping devil bat. To proselytize is to convert from one religion or doctrine to another. For instance, the former Buddhist had been proselytized by a Baptist minister. I have a friend who's a socialist, and she's always proselytizing me, trying to convince me to vote her party's platform. Well, I trust you're not capricious enough to consider doing such a thing. No. Caprice has never been one of my more salient characteristics. Capricious, you sly devil, means unpredictable or likely to change at any moment. It's the adjective form of the noun caprice, which is a whim. Bill, you know Bill, is very capricious. One minute he said his favorite car was a Chevy Caprice. The next minute he said it was a Camaro. Here's another. The weather in New York is often capricious. One minute it's snowing, the next it's 120 degrees in the shade. Capricious is quite closely related to mercurial. Oh well, being capricious, I feel like moving on to the next word. To qualify something is to modify or restrict it. Susan qualified her praise of Jack by saying that her kind words applied only to his skillful cooking and not to his deplorable lack of personal hygiene. Needless to say, Jack was upset by Susan's qualification. I know I would be. Last one. The library trustees rated their fundraiser a qualified success, while many more people than expected showed up. Virtually no money was made. An unqualified success is a complete, unrestricted success. Now what about vicissitude? The vicissitudes of the stock market were too much for Penny. She decided to look for more stable kinds of investments that she could count on. That covers it rather nicely. A vicissitude is a change in fortune or an upheaval. Here's another. The vicissitudes of the local political machine were such that one could never quite be certain whom one was supposed to bribe. The vicissitudes of life in New York, I think, are grossly understated by Suzanne. She says life is stable, but judging from what I hear from people who have recently visited, things can change very quickly in that town. I saw a movie about New York, and it seems there were a lot of transient people there. That's an easy word to remember because it sounds like what it means. Those people don't stay in one place for a long time. Right. Anything can be transient if it changes location often or is just plain temporary. The transient breeze provided some relief from the summer heat, but we were soon perspiring again when it stopped. Our jobs as voiceover artists for this recording series are transient. As soon as we finish, we'll be out of work again. But at least we'll have each other. Well, you can't be too sure. The vicissitudes of life might prove our relationship more transient than we currently imagine. If I go to New York, I may never see you again. Next word. You seem to be wavering about whether or not to go to New York. You're vacillating. You're right. To vacillate means to waver or to be indecisive. Tyler vacillated about buying a new car. He couldn't decide whether to buy one or not. Let's do a quick review, and then we'll cover the words in a brief speech. Right. Mercurial. Emotionally unpredictable, rapidly changing in mood. Metamorphosis. A magical change in shape 
or a striking change. Proselytize. To attempt to convert someone from one religion or belief to another. Capricious. Whimsical. Quick to change one's mind or stance. Vicissitude. A great upheaval or natural change. Qualify. To modify, change, or restrict. Transient. Temporary, not staying for a long time. Vacillate. To waver back and forth, to be indecisive. All right. Are we ready for our next visitor? Meet award winning set designer David Solomon. I wasn't always certain that I wanted to be a set designer. For a long time, I wavered back and forth. I vacillated between wanting to be a set designer and wanting to be a meat packer. I think I made the right choice because I enjoy changing the look of a stage. It's like magic. With very little money, I can metamorphose a dark theater into any setting imaginable. I can give you a simple American living room or suggest the whole of Paris. I strive for perfection. Sometimes, when I'm not satisfied with my work, I'll strike an entire set and start over. Hence, I've been accused of being not quite emotionally reliable, even mercurial. But if people think I'm bad, they should get a load of the directors. They're the whimsical, capricious types who can never stick with one decision for long. No, no, let me be fair. I should qualify that remark. They're not all that bad. The big drawback to my life is that I must travel from town to town and theater to theater, a very transient lifestyle. I have a good friend who's a lawyer in Baltimore. He's always trying to convince me to settle down and get a real job. He also knows I'm no easy convert. Better people than he have tried to proselytize me about my career choice, and all have failed. Despite all the hardships of working with difficult directors and the vicissitudes of life on the road, I still love my career. And now, the other half of The More Things Change, The More They Stay the Same. These words will be about things that don't change, that stay just as they are. Okay, let's begin with static, and I don't mean electricity. As an adjective, it means stationary, not changing or moving. Here's an example Sales of the new book soared for a few weeks, then became static. They stopped moving altogether. How about your relationship with your father has been woefully static for the last ten years or so? Nothing's changed, and you still haven't forgiven him. Why, that's right. Aren't you sweet to remember? Our relationship is in a state of torpor. Torpor is sluggishness, inactivity, or even apathy. For instance, after consuming the guinea pig, the boa constrictor fell into a torpid sleep that lasted several days. To be in a state of torpor is to be torpid. Poor pig. My old math teacher tried to reduce the torpor of his students by poking them with an electric cattle prod. It was too late, though. His laborious teaching already had us in irreversible comas. It's a miracle that you're with us today, especially since you are all so torpid. It must have been the fact that you're so tenacious. You refuse to give up on life. I was. I was persistent, stubborn, and I didn't let go. And that's just what tenacious means. Listen, the foreign student's tenacious effort to learn English won him the admiration of all the teachers at his school. Or, the ivy growing on the side of our house was so tenacious that we had to tear down the house to get rid of it. That ivy and that foreign student both showed great tenacity. To be tenacious is to have tenacity. Time for another word, immutable. Immutable means, quite simply, unchangeable. It's easy to remember. If you mutate something, you change it. If you can't mutate something, it's immutable, unchangeable. Jerry's mother, for instance, had only one immutable rule no dancing on the dinner table. Another, the statue of the former principal looked down upon the students with an immutable scowl. He was, after all, a statue. Both mutable and immutable come from the Latin root meaning change. So do mutation and mutant, but we won't even go near those. Instead, let's try doctrinaire. A doctrinaire supporter of manned space flights to Pluto would be someone who supported such space flights, even though they are virtually impossible to do. So, doctrinaire means inflexibly committed to a doctrine or theory without regard for its practicality. And I suppose that it can also be a noun. So, a person who has doctrinaire views can be called a doctrinaire? A doctrinaire has very dogmatic views. Dogmatic means arrogantly assertive of unproven ideas. A dogma is a belief. 
A dogmatic person, however, is stubbornly convinced of his beliefs. Good. Now let's look at another good one. Stagnation is motionlessness. Inactivity. Many years of carelessly dumping pollutants led to the gradual stagnation of the lake. There is now virtually no life in it. To fall into stagnation is to stagnate. To be in a state of stagnation is to be stagnant. Despite her extraordinary talents and otherworldly beauty, the aging actress's career appears to be stagnating. She can't seem to get into a hit. Sad but true. But think, if she holds on, if she can just be steadfast for a little while longer, she'll be okay. To be steadfast is to be unwavering, loyal, and faithful. Steadfast love, for example, rare as it is, is love that never wavers. To be steadfast in a relationship is to be faithfully committed. Steadfast is like a rock. Yeah, yeah, okay, enough about steadfast already. You can be so redundant, repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Redundant is unnecessarily repetitive or excessive. Bill, you remember Bill, already bought paper plates, so our purchase of paper plates was redundant. Our purchase of paper plates was redundant. And you call me redundant. You're a master of redundancy. The title, Department of Redundancy Department, is redundant. And I think that should just about do it for redundant. Redundant. Right you are. So before I come after you with a sledgehammer, let's do a quick review of the remains the same words. Static. Stationary. Not changing or moving. Torpor. Sluggishness or inactivity. Immutable. Unchangeable. Tenacious. Persistent, stubborn, not letting go. Doctrinaire. Stubbornly committed to a faith or idea no matter how impractical it may be. Dogmatic. Stubbornly assertive of unproven ideas. Steadfast. Unwavering, loyal, faithful. Redundant. Unnecessarily repetitive, repetitive, or repetitive. Stagnation. Motionlessness or inactivity. And now let's meet Jean Fitzpatrick, a low-level bureaucrat from the Pentagon who'd like to talk about the peace dividend. I'd like to address the issue of cutting back on the defense budget. Can't be done. Shouldn't be done. Won't be done. Not if I have anything to say about it. You can't change us here at the Pentagon. We're immutable. And we're not going to change our minds, ever. We're not hearing any arguments to the contrary. Call us insistent, stubborn, downright dogmatic, if you like. But I say the Cold War is not over. And I am inflexible on this point, no matter how doctrinaire I may seem. That's what we are. We'll stick to our guns and never waver. Steadfast to the end. I personally would rather push the button right now than just let everything come to a standstill just because of a budget cut. I don't plan to let our department stagnate. You can bank on that. I know it looks as if our enemies are now our friends, but don't trust them for a minute. Things haven't really changed. You'd be surprised how static everything actually is. Those communists may look like they're out of power, but I warn you, they are as tenacious as bulldogs. They just won't quit. Just because we no longer have the constant threat of nuclear annihilation keeping us on our toes is no reason to become lazy, sluggish, or torpid. Now, more than ever, we need some get up and go. Now, I don't like to repeat myself, but at the risk of being redundant, the defense cutbacks can't, shouldn't, and won't happen. Thank you. Now that we've learned all the words from the group The More Things Change, The More They Stay the Same, it's time for one last review. Let's delay no longer. Let's hear those words. Metamorphosis A metamorphosis is a magical change of shape or a sudden and striking change. Caterpillars go through a metamorphosis and become butterflies, even though it's not technically magic. Static Static is unmoving, unchanging, still. Betsy's love life is static. It never gets any better or worse. It just is. Redundant. Redundant means excessively repetitive. 
I find John Wayne's performances redundant. In every film, he does the same thing. You see one, you've seen them all. Mercurial. Someone whose mood changes quickly and unpredictably is mercurial. My boss John is mercurial. He's cheerful one moment, stern the next, then absent minded after that. Dogmatic. Someone who is dogmatic doesn't like to change their mind. As my grandmother gets older, she becomes increasingly dogmatic. She still insists I wear a coat and tie when we go into town. Tenacious. Tenacious means stubborn, persistent, not willing to let go. Ticks are tenacious insects. Qualify. To qualify something is to modify or restrict it. Norman's fantasy of overnight celebrity was qualified by the reality of his persistent anonymity. Doctrinaire. Doctrinaire means stubbornly committed to even the worst ideas or, and this is a good mnemonic device, doctrine. My dog is doctrinaire about her incessant desire to eat everything in sight. Vicissitude. A vicissitude is a great upheaval or change in fortune. The band's career endured many vicissitudes, including the marriage of the drummer and the loss of the lead singer's voice. Proselytize. To proselytize is to try to convert someone to another set of beliefs or religion. Ari Krishnas are famous for their tireless ability to proselytize non believers about their faith. Immutable. Immutable is unchangeable. The tides, the sunrise and the sunset, death and taxes, all these are immutable facts of life. Capricious. Children are naturally capricious. They are given to their own whims and change their minds frequently. Torpid. Torpor is sluggishness, inactivity, and apathy. After living in New York City long enough, the fear, excitement, and energy that people first feel when they move there inevitably gives way to numbness and torpor. They feel torpid. Transient. Transient is temporary, not staying in one place for any length of time. Circus performers live transient lives. They never stay put for long and live in trains. Steadfast. A person who doesn't waver, who is like a rock, is steadfast. Politicians are rarely steadfast. They change to suit the political climate and to win more votes. Vacillate. To vacillate is to waver and not make a decision. Hamlet, who asked the question, to be or not to be, was famous for his vacillating and the consequences of his indecisiveness. Stagnate. Stagnate means to stop moving, to become inactive. If you let your brain stagnate for too long, you'll get simple minded. Leave it to you to end on an upbeat note. Well, at least no one will forget what stagnate means. That's the end of the more things change, the more they stay the same. As always, you should be sure to review the words on the enclosed insert card and memorize their.